Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. About two minutes away from the end of the trading day, Kriti Gupta, Shanali Basak at the anchor desk, counting you down to the closing bell and here to take us beyond the bell with the global simulcast. We're joined now by our colleagues Katie Greifeld and Paul Sweeney, bringing together our Bloomberg television, radio and our YouTube audiences. You can get us anywhere around the world to, of course, parse through the crucial moments of the trading day. Katie, it has been a wild day in the market. We talked about this earlier in the show. How many people have just decided to throw their hands up in the air, go home, drink some hot chocolate, <laughs> and watch this sell-off continue? I'm not sure that's what they're drinking. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. You, I, if you look at the volume, it's not you know as low as you would expect today. It's pretty much average. And you look at the S&P 500 right now, it's still down 1.5%, to be sure. But we were looking at losses of 3% earlier, so it's halved those. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm looking at here a little bit. The trading kind of in that last half hour, we kind of came off the, the lows a little bit here. So that gives you a little bit of optimism. But we've just talked to a guest earlier today who put out a very, very uh, credible bear case, which is basically we got more earnings risk in this market, folks, and that hasn't really been factored in. Uh, yeah, there's earnings risk in the market. There's still rate risk in this market. There's all sorts of risk in this market at the end of the day. And, you know, even if you believe inflation is peaked here, it's not just the fact that it's rolling over that you're watching. It's the pace at which it comes down. I think that's the important story that is being lost here every time someone comes on and says that inflation is peaked. Inflation is peaked. And I think the liquidity story continues to be a really big story as we talk about simply how much people actually are able to make those uh, market bids and market spreads that you are seeing in the market right now. At a time, by the way, when Shanali's been talking about this this whole time, $1.7 trillion is about to be pumped into this economy. Well, those are the closing bells. You can see the S&P 500 off by 1.4%. The Nasdaq even worse, down by 2%. Look at the Dow, though, the relative outperformer there, Crudy. Yeah, it really is. And to me, I think it's the momentum trade that's really important. The Nasdaq, the Russell, are you starting to see those starting to sink back up at a time when those chip stocks are really dragging down the S&P 500? And I would argue the Dow as well. And you look at the S&P 500, 88 names closing in the green. That means over 400 were closing in the red. So pretty broad-based selling there, Shanali. Yeah, broad-based selling. Let's just take a look at just how much red there has been today and how deep that red went because autos, semis, autos down more than 7%, almost 8% on the day. Why is that so interesting? You have everything from worries around used cars with CarMax and Carvana to Tesla and the discounts it's providing here being watched very closely. Semis, remember Micron had a very disappointing uh, event yesterday when it came to earnings releases as well as outlooks as well as job cuts so you are seeing a lot of pain here even energy down 2.3 percent on the day that is the favorite of the year it is selling off just a little bit today you had a little bit of green on the screen telecom consumer durables up uh, basically one half of one percent but not a lot of love in the market today guys not a lot of love I did find three <laughs> names at least in the green let's start with FedEx of course they reported earnings earlier this week we're talking about price hikes. We're talking about cost cutting. Management increases the estimate of savings to about $1 billion. Shareholders seem to love it. You're looking at a second day of gains. That stock up over 3%. And that makes sense. That's an earning story. I have two mysteries coming up for you, though. You have VF Corp. So FedEx was the biggest gainer in the S&P 500. This is the second biggest gainer. It's up for a second day. I don't have a good reason why necessarily but it is up about three percent in a down market and then moving on we also have warner brothers discovery also up for a second day also with no clear catalyst maybe people are watching a lot of holiday movies but in any case <laughs> that stock higher by about two percent paul yeah plenty of uh, losers to look at here on this thursday trade and let's start with tesla down nine percent and you know as matt Levine and his money stuff column will, will say, oh, Elon. So there's still that Elon pressure uh, as it relates to what's he doing with Twitter. But there's also some fundamentals out there. Uh, for the first time for Tesla in a long time, they're actually offering an incentive on some of their cars. And that goes to the question of demand out there. How is the demand for electric vehicles and for Teslas in particular, uh, given that the economy may be slowing, inflation, consumers may not have uh, that discretional spending for a new car. Uh, Carnival Cruise Lines, I am not a cruiser, but I do know many cruisers, and they are adamant that they are going to continue cruising. Uh, Carnival Cruise Line yesterday had some results that were generally in line 
but the guidance was weaker for the 2023 than I think some people were looking for. So again, still some issues there. And then as uh, you guys were talking about earlier, NVIDIA, uh, one of the leading chip stocks, uh, uh, down 7%. And that's kind of on the back of, you know, the Micron news, which is kind of really put some pressure on the chips across the board. And NVIDIA uh, certainly getting caught up in that. Yeah, Paul, and part of that inflationary story in the past year or so has been the chip story because we couldn't catch up to the really a mind-blowing demand that you saw in that space. That led to the inflationary story and yields higher. Today, it's a similar story where you are seeing the front end of the curve really see a pretty big move. Six basis points higher on the two-year yield, 427 inching closer and closer, but not quite there to that terminal rate. At the long end, we are also seeing a move, but really only two to three basis points between the 10, 20, and 30. So really uh, seeing a sell-off more towards the front end, Shanali. Yeah, so many things to bake in here. Cross currents, as we keep talking about them. It's been the yield story all year. 368 you're seeing on that 10-year. But listen, there's more data to be had. This year's not over. We're looking at PCE that is expected to undershoot the Fed's forecast. That's what is expected from Bloomberg Economics. I am excited to see how this pans out. There's also, by the way, that massive spending package that we are looking. $1.7 trillion. And boy, does that set us up for next year. It does set us up for next year, a year in which at the same time you're expecting to see the earnings outlook deteriorate. How many times have we heard the phrase earnings recession in the past couple of weeks? Doesn't seem to be priced yet in when you look at the earnings estimates expected out of Wall Street. But at the same time, what that means for the bond market, again, Shanali, like you said, <laughs> I mean, the yield story has been incredible this year. And I don't know about you guys, but everyone I talk to, and that's only slightly in exaggeration, <laughs> is bullish on bonds right now. Bullish on bonds and talking about duration, maybe going out a little bit longer on the duration curve here. And that's maybe the way to play uh, this bond market. But like uh, Katie was mentioning, a lot of bond bulls out there. And that's, I guess, not surprising after one of the worst years, if not the worst year in fixed income in 2022. Well, baked into that bull case is, once again, I'm going to quote Ira Jersey, chief rate strategist over at Bloomberg Intelligence, is this idea that Fed uh, cuts priced into the back half of 2023 are going to cap those yields. So that's kind of this opposite direction or opposite pressure that you're going to see from the inflationary story. And Shanali, let's push this forward here, because at the end of the day, you mentioned the PCE data. It's not the only data we get tomorrow. We also get UMish consumer confidence numbers, which ordinarily isn't something a lot of people trade off of. But in the last couple of iterations of that data, it has been a market mover. It has been so interesting, especially as we've seen some positive consumer data come out earlier in this week and the hawkish sign that was embedded in that data between spending, between the consumer. Uh, remember, there's plenty of stimulus still in the system. Is there reason to stay hawkish if there's not a hard landing here, if there's only a mild recession, as consensus says? The crazy thing about all of this is if consensus from, again, the sell side here is for a cut at some point next year, that means the offsides risk is a risk that a lot of people have been putting up here that they hold or even raise. So something to keep an eye out. Uh, 2023 is already tiring me out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, if you, if you talk to some of the more bullish people out there, and I'll, I'll talk about uh, Vince Signorello, who's a macro strategist for Bloomberg News, and his call is basically the Fed can stop. The Fed can stop right here. Inflation is coming down. It's peaked. Um, it's the Fed rate increases have done their job. They're doing their job. And once we get to that point, that's when risk assets take off. He thought it might be late, late 2022, mm -hmm. too early there. Uh, but perhaps in the first half of uh, 23, the market will begin discounting what might be a better rate of I love Vince, but that is a big call. I mean, there is a <laughs> lot of daylight between a 7% handle and the 2% target that the Fed is still sticking to. Pell had the opportunity to back away from it at that December Fed meeting. He didn't, and I know that they're concerned about the lagged effects of their tightening, but at this point, I mean, what we have heard from the top down is that it's way too soon to stop. Yeah, well, Vince has certainly been the contrarian, but I think at the core of the trade is the idea that there is this kind of PTSD from several decades ago. We don't want a Volcker repeat. We don't want to basically put this market and this economy on autopilot for that inflationary come down only to have to reverse and go in the other direction. You hit the I? nail on the head. <laughs> the, the risk here is that you have to abandon 2%. And that is the big worry that would have much more structural damage. Right. And all of a sudden, you and I are not talking about quick pivots into next year. We're talking about a much bigger, longer problem here.
Well, the good news for everybody is I will be here next week mm -hmm. bringing it all to you. <laughs> so we'll have to see how this plays out. But we've got one more big uh, trading day uh, tomorrow. Then we'll see how it goes post-Christmas. Yeah, it really does. I mean, I've been saying this for about two weeks, but it really feels like we're really at the end of the trading year. When you think about we have PCE tomorrow, we have those UMish numbers. Uh, I'm logging off at 1.30 tomorrow. So good luck to you guys, because that does it for our cross-platform coverage of the market close on Bloomberg Television, Radio, YouTube, and on Bloomberg Quick Take. You guys will be back tomorrow, same time, same place.